bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled Sleep Disturbance in Children and Their Families Across the Continuum of Care. And once again, we have an excellent panel of uh, researchers today brought to us uh, from our nursing network. Uh, I hope many of you were able to join them at uh, the CAFC Annual Conference in Quebec, uh, where they had a session talking about leading practices from uh, coast to coast uh, back last month in October. It was a great session, great turnout, always a great opportunity for our nursing colleagues to get together and connect on, on, on the state of nursing research uh, across Canada and to collaborate and share thoughts. So it's, it's my pleasure to bring a few of those uh, folks from that network work uh, to our, uh, our webinar uh, program today and uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. Uh, first up we're going to have Dr. Robin Str uh, Stremler. Uh, Robin is a nurse scientist whose research is aimed at improving sleep for children and parents. Uh, specific areas of research include uh, sleep for families with a child with uh, health challenges in the hospital or community settings, sleep across pregnancy and the postpartum, and e-health and m-health interventions to improve uh, sleep for infants and children. Uh, Robin is a, an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing and an adjunct, sci adjunct scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, following Robin, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Efrosini Papakonstantinou. Uh, and and Efrosini is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Her clinical background is in pediatric nursing where she's worked closely with uh, families and members of the interdisciplinary care team to provide comprehensive care to families whose child require uh, invasive cardiac procedures. But for her doctoral dissertation, uh, she developed and evaluated an innovative program called the Relax to Sleep program to improve the sleep of hospitalized children during their stays, hospital stays, and once they've been discharged home. Uh, and following uh, that, we have we will hear from uh, Dr. Krista Kelty. Uh, Krista is a nurse practitioner and project investigator with the Center for Innovation and Excellence in Child and Family Centered Care at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, Krista's clinical practice has informed a program of research that targets improvements in the experience and outcomes for family caregivers of children with medical complexity across the continuum of care. Uh, Krista currently holds the Janice Rotman Postdoctoral Fellowship for Innovation in Pediatric Home Care through the Department of Pediatrics at SickKids and a CIHR Sleep and Biological Rhythms Postdoctoral Training Fellowship through the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. Uh, and Laura, uh, Krista is also an active trainee with the CIHR Better Nights, Better Days training program, uh, as well as the Canadian Child Health Clinician Scientist program. So certainly some a wealth of expertise on our panel today, and it's my pleasure to uh, hand, the pro hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Robin Strimler. Over to you. Thanks very much, Doug. Uh, it's great to be here. We're uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to share some of our work, and uh, we'll, we'll get started. So as Doug said, I'm going to go first and um, I'm going to describe for you two studies that we've conducted uh, looking at parents' experiences while their child was hospitalized and then child's, um, children's sleep experiences in hospital. I'd like to acknowledge uh, funding for my work from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, as well as the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation to me for uh, salary support and um, a couple of funds at the University of Toronto and the Sleep Research Society for funds for conducting the projects. So sleep is really a, a needed uh, activity for restoration and repair of the body. There's an ever-growing body of evidence that if you miss out on sleep, it affects your physiological health, your psychological health, uh, your ability to regulate emotions. Cognitive function declines if you miss out on sleep, so your brain just doesn't work as well. 
And we know that if you miss out on sleep, your immune system function is impaired, so you're more prone to infection. And endocrine function is impaired, so glucose regulation, for example, appetite regulation are impaired. It's important to note that sleep disturbance can occur via a few different pathways. You may just not sleep enough, so you are sleep restricted. You don't accumulate enough minutes of sleep. But you can also have disturbed sleep via sleep fragmentation, so you're sleeping enough minutes, but those minutes are all broken up, so you're not reaching the deeper stages of sleep, which we'll look at in a moment. Or you may have your circadian rhythm disrupted, so your bedtimes and wake times may vary a great deal across uh, days and nights. Or uh, you may be sleeping out of uh, usual sleeping hours on some days and within usual sleep hours in others. So why do we worry about your sleep being interrupted? Uh, it's because of the sleep stages that you can enter. So this diagram shows you that we typically move through sleep stages starting in stage one and transitioning through one, two, three, four, and REM sleep in pretty much uh, that order. The stage one and two sleep are lighter stages of sleep, uh, important, but do not get you into um, a very deep sleep. For that, you have to move through the initial stages into stages three and four sleep, and those are thought to be the deep restorative stages of sleep. Following those, you move into REM sleep, which is particularly important for children because we know um, it has implications for learning, for memory consolidation, uh, especially important in the younger years. So given all these important aspects of sleep, um, during hospitalization is really when you most need all those benefits of sleep. And um, so we may be looking at altering sleep at a time when it's needed most. Uh, children who are in hospital and of course their parents who so often stay with them then are attempting to sleep in an environment that's really not focused on optimizing sleep but focused on optimizing patient care. So um, our interest in the, the studies that we're going to tell you about today are really aimed at developing interventions so that we can improve sleep. And in order to do that, we first really need to understand the experiences of children who are trying to sleep in hospital and their parents who accompany them. Um, my lab has done some previous work describing the range of practices around sleep in pediatric hospitals and also nurses' experiences in providing care for families at night. Uh, but our, our presentations today will focus on uh, sleep in hospital and sleep uh, in the community for parents who care for their children at home. So uh, the first uh, study that I'm going to talk about is one in which we examined sleep for parents who had a child hospitalized in a critical care unit. And these two publications that you can see listed on the screen um, focus uh, the first on the quantitative data we collected and the second on the qualitative data. And I'd like to acknowledge um, my co-authors, the contributors uh, to those studies. So really by doing this study, what we wanted to do for the first time was to use objective measures to describe sleep for parents who had a child who was hospitalized in the pediatric ICU. And we looked at their sleep patterns, uh, how many minutes of sleep they achieved, what the quality of their sleep was, so how much time they spent awake after sleep onset, that's WASO, and the number of awakenings they had at night. We also uh, measured their sleepiness and their fatigue and some psychological outcomes. So we wanted to look at depression and anxiety and decisional conflict, knowing that if you miss out on sleep, uh, your brain doesn't process information as well or make decisions as well. So we wanted to get a sense of that. 
So this was a prospective study. Uh, we observed families over five days and nights. We enrolled parents who had a child who was expected to stay in the PICU for at least two nights, and then we followed them onto the general units uh, if they were discharged from the PICU. And we used uh, actigraphy and sleep diaries to measure their sleep. And within the sleep diary were embedded measures of their fatigue and their sleepiness. And after the five days and nights, we asked parents uh, to complete measures of anxiety and depression and decisional conflict. So what is actigraphy? This is a way of measuring sleep objectively. So you can see on the left, uh, it's a wristwatch size device that is worn on the wrist by the um, parent. Inside the device is an accelerometer, and that measures motion. And that motion is recorded continuously for as long as the wearer is using the device. And then we're able to run algorithms on those movement data in order to translate that into whether sleep was occurring or not. So for each minute, the algorithm makes a determination of whether the person was asleep or awake. And on the right, you can see this is what we see when uh, we look at the actigraphy data. So all the green lines uh, are uh, demonstrating how much movement there was. You can see in the middle of the screen, the movement really declines, and that represents the period where sleep was occurring. So it's a nice, objective way, much more reliable way of measuring sleep than sleep diaries, where we're relying on people's recall, uh, which, of course, if they're sleep deprived, is going to be uh, less accurate. Uh, so this is a great way to measure sleep. So we enrolled 118 parents in our study and uh, got complete sleep data on 87% of those. Uh, the children were uh, around three years of age on average, and the length of stay in the PICU was uh, a median of two days. And we had a distribution of reasons for admission from acute illness or trauma to chronic illness exacerbations, as well as planned surgery. Oh, what did their sleep look like? I've presented here the number of minutes of nighttime sleep um, and split it by gender. So you can see that for moms, they achieved on average across the five nights um, a little bit over seven hours of sleep a night or 422 minutes. And the fathers achieved about a half hour less than that. And that made sense from our qualitative uh, data. Dads really described having to um, do a lot of commuting and um, caring for other family members while mothers uh, predominantly stayed uh, with the child in hospital and that commute time um, seemed to really cut into their nighttime sleep. While they were getting long stretches of nighttime sleep, which we worry about so that they are able to get into the deeper stages of sleep, they were also experiencing a lot of wake time after they had initially fallen asleep. So for a diagnosis of insomnia, we look for 30 minutes or more of wake time at night. And you can see both dads were spending an hour or more on average awake at night after having fallen asleep. They had a fair number of wakings during the night, and these may just have been brief wakings that they might not have remembered in the morning. And there was some attempt to make up for um, sleep that may have been lost at night by sleeping a bit during the day, about a half hour on average. When we looked, though, at uh, the number of hours of sleep achieved across all the parent nights, you can see that over a quarter of the parent nights were less than six hours of sleep a night. And that's what we consider significant sleep restriction. You really are sleep deprived if you're sleeping less than six hours a night, with the ideal for an adult being seven um, to eight hours of sleep a night. You can also see, though, that there were um, a significant number of nights that were within the seven to eight hour 
range. And so when the parents um, described to us their sleep in the qualitative data, we were able to see that there was a great deal of sleeping short one night, perhaps because you were the parent staying with the child in the room that night, and then switching off duties with uh, your partner uh, so that you were able to catch up on those nights. So quite a lot of short sleeping followed by a night where you were able to sleep an adequate amount. Um, location of parents' sleep varied greatly, as you can see across all these different locations. And certainly in our qualitative data, parents described uh, never quite knowing where they might find a spot to sleep. Fatigue scores were quite high, so this is a scale, a visual analog scale from 0 to 100, and the maximum score uh, on average was 60 out of 100. And the sleepiness scale scores were quite high as well, with a maximum score of 4 out of 7, and that would represent a description of your sleepiness as feeling very foggy, let down, um, needing to rest. These are the uh, anxiety, depression, and decisional conflict scores. And you can see that about a quarter of the families um, reported anxiety scores that were in the clinical range. Those are scores over 60. About half of the families um, reported depression scores that were in a concerning range. So a score over 21 is a, a score suggesting uh, possible clinical depression. And in terms of decisional conflict, again, about a quarter of parents said um, that they felt they had trouble making decisions about their child's care. Um, there was, uh, when we looked at the data, um, there wasn't any one variable that explained getting more minutes of nighttime sleep. Um, we did see that sleeping in a hotel or a parent room or a residence meant that more wakes occurred uh, than if you were in a hospital lounge or a waiting room, and that was counter to what we were uh, expecting, perhaps. Um, suggesting that location of the parent um, close to the, the child is, is more important. And for those who spent time at home, um, decisional uh, conflict was higher than those who um, stayed in a parent room or residence. Again, perhaps suggesting location is really important, uh, proximity to the child. Also from our qualitative data, parents really uh, described a struggle with trying to determine whether they should be at the bedside or um, to go home um, to get uh, some rest so they could better support their child. And of course, described difficult thoughts and feelings getting in the way of their sleep, um, having challenges giving time to caring for themselves and their family, and, of course, the hospital environment, the noise and the light in the setting um, really interfering with their sleep. So parents were uh, sleep restricted and achieved less than six hours on a number of nights. And we think that that variability of nighttime sleep across the nights may explain their higher levels of sleepiness and fatigue, so representing a, a circadian rhythm uh, disruption. So there's more work to do in this area, particularly in exploring the psychological um, outcomes and their relationship to sleep. So I'll finish off the, the last few minutes of my time telling you a bit about a study where we examined children's sleep in hospital. And uh, before our work, uh, previous studies really just use observation to determine uh, the amount of children's sleep, which of course is prone uh, to error. Uh, just because a child has their eyes closed doesn't mean that they are asleep. Um, but those studies showed um, that there was decreased nighttime sleep, frequent awakenings, and not much time to get into a period of deeper sleep. 
So for us, again, we wanted to use those objective measures to get at sleep quantity and quality. And we also wanted to measure noise and light in the environment. So we enrolled uh, children who were either on a general pediatric unit or in the PICU. We wanted them to be in hospital for at least three nights. And we again used actigraphy and a sleep diary completed by the parent or the child if they were old enough. And we had these little devices that you can see on the right of the screen. Um, the one on the left is our actigraph, so it's a smaller size for the child to wear. And then we have a separate noise meter and light meter that were placed at the child's bedside. <coughs> We enrolled 69 children, and they ranged in age from 1 to 18. Uh, 11 of those children were in the critical care unit when we began the study, and 58 were on a general pediatrics unit. Uh, predominantly, they were uh, admitted for a chronic illness um, or a, an acute illness or trauma. And there was a wide distribution of how far the families uh, were from their home. So these are the number of minutes of nighttime sleep. Um, you can see the red line it represents in-hospital sleep. The green line recommends the uh, hours of sleep as per the National Sleep Foundation. And the blue line is what the families reported their child usually slept at home. So you can see there is a big discrepancy between the in-hospital sleep and either the usual or recommended sleep. Um, we're talking about a three-hour difference uh, for most of the age groups. When we break it apart, looking at critical care nights, and those are the ones in blue with the general uh, pediatric unit nights, you can see that the critical care nights are even further restricted when we pull them out. Uh, so in that case, we're talking about 400 minutes of difference, um, so hours and hours of sleep deprivation across all the age groups. Nighttime awakenings were very high, so um, in the parent sleep, we were looking at about seven or eight awakenings a night. You can see uh, in um, the children's sleep, they're waking up many, many more times a night, um, making it very difficult for them to get in those deeper stages of sleep. We wanted to look at, well, were children achieving daytime sleep that allowed them to make up for the missed sleep? Uh, so they were getting um, an hour or two on average of sleep during the day. But when we add that into their nighttime sleep, they're still not reaching the recommended amounts for 24 hours sleep. Sound levels were quite high over an extended number of minutes. So this is minutes of sound above 46 decibels at nighttime. And 46 decibels is the World Health Organization recommendation uh, sleep uh, for uh, the level of noise that uh, below which is necessary for adequate sleep. So you can see reaching almost an hour of accumulated time above that level. If we look at levels above 80 decibels, which is about the sound of a jackhammer, you can see uh, up to 20 minutes of time spent at noise levels. Um, at those uh, sound levels. And you can see the red lines are even higher. So counter to what we expected, the noise was actually higher on the general pediatric units than the um, critical care units. And light was less of a concern um, than we expected. So there were um, you know, up to about 20 minutes of light at levels that would ex be expected to interfere with sleep. So that's over 150 lux, which is a measure of light. And this uh, is a picture that we, um, as part of the study, asked um, the older children to draw for us what uh, it was like to spend um, time trying to sleep in hospital. And this was uh, one of the adolescents who, who really um, expressed for us how 
noise um, and interruptions for care uh, got in the way of sleeping at night. So, um, you know, uh, for children in hospital, their sleep quantity is significantly decreased. Um, frequent awakenings also mean that um, they're not getting into the deeper stages of sleep, so their sleep quality is poor as well. And light and sound levels, in spite of us knowing that those interfere with sleep, continue to be above uh, recommended levels. So putting uh, those studies together, I think future directions need to look at knowledge translation, knowledge implementation strategies around noise and light reduction. Um, our qualitative data has given us some insight into families' barriers to achieving sleep while their child is hospitalized. And from our work with, um, with nurses, we know we need to look at policies around monitoring at night. And finally, we need to move towards examining interventions to improve sleep for hospitalized children and their parents. And uh, that leads us nicely into Efrosini's work uh, where she has begun to look at how can we improve uh, sleep for children who are hospitalized. So I will hand over to her. All right, thank you, Dr. Strimler. Um, and that's just my opportunity to remind uh, the audience that uh, at any time you have any questions, please do type them into the question box, and we will certainly uh, get to them uh, at the next uh, break in the presentation. But for now, we'll go off to uh, Dr. Baba Constantinou, and uh, we'll hear the next portion of the presentation. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for pronouncing my name so lovely. That's great. Um, so, again, my presentation will focus on my PhD work, which looked at a behavioral educational intervention to um, increase pediatric sleep during hospitalization. And this was a pilot randomized control trial. So first off, again, this work would not be possible without my sources of funding, but also uh, the expertise and guidance of my PhD supervisor, who you've just heard from, Dr. Stremler, and my committee members, um, Drs. Ellen Hodnett and Cindy Lee Dennis. So again, sleep is essential for the health and well-being of all, not just children. Um, despite the common misconception that sleep is a very passive state, in actuality, there's a lot of higher brain activity occurring while we're fast asleep. So we know sleep serves both reparative and restorative roles within the body. And so disturbing one's sleep or not getting enough of sleep um, really has a number of negative health consequences in children. So again, consequences, just to reiterate, uh, Dr. Stremler talked about this, so impairments in learning and processing, mood and modulating emotions, um, problems with daytime behavior, so some children might be more aggressive, <clears throat> and a number of physiological consequences such as the immune system. So we know that as many as 20 to 30 percent of young children and adolescents are not getting enough sleep and they experience some kind of sleep problem. And these, are, these sleep problems can often be exacerbated during periods of illness. So just like an adult, you're not feeling well, you know, you might be coughing all night, so your sleep is often disturbed and exacerbated during those times. And so we don't actually know the prevalence of sleep problems in hospitalized children, but it's expected that children are at risk for sleep disturbances. So during hospitalization, sleep may be altered at a time when the benefits of sleep are needed the most. And um, as Dr. Stremler mentioned in, in her uh, presentation, children, they lose 20 to 25 percent of their expected sleep time, and that's attributed to a number of different factors. So they'll have delayed sleep onset. So they're not actually, if their bedtime is usually 8 o'clock, they're not going to bed until 10 or 11 while in hospital. And of course, frequent interruptions, because as healthcare professionals, we need to do um, thorough assessments, and sometimes that, that includes um, waking up the child, and so therefore, we're decreasing that nighttime sleep. 
And also, children who've been hospitalized may also develop what are called um, new onset maladaptive behaviors. So these are behaviors that are regressional in nature, and you often see them like during the first week once they're discharged home, they might have sleep problems um, related to sleep anxieties and develop other regressional nature, uh, behaviors. So there are a number of factors disturbing sleep during hospitalization, um, and they can be clustered into three main categories, so environmental cues, and um, that includes bright lights during the night, um, exposure to darkness during the day, physiological issues, um, pain being the biggest one. So if the child is in pain, then they're not going to be able to sleep. But if they're severely sleep restricted, they're also going to have a decreased threshold for pain. And then finally, psychological issues, and that really the focus is on anxiety. So children that are hospitalized may have feelings of tension, nervousness, um, they may be worried about either their diagnosis or just the experience being in a new environment. And so that will really increase their vigilance and arousal. So every time a nurse will walk in, all of a sudden their eyes bolt open and they'll be like much more aroused thinking, oh my God, is it needle time? Am I going to be in pain? In younger children, um, we often see separation anxiety from their parents. And then also the anticipatory anxiety. So children who have frequent hospitalizations or who've had a previous um, experience in hospital and have had an awful experience or a perceived awful experience, they're actually anticipating the worst for their current hospital stay. So that anxiety really leads to the arousal of the autonomic nervous system. And there's another, a, a number of physiological effects. So you'll have increased heart rate, your rest rates will be higher, and those are not conducive to actually um, promote sleep or initiate sleep and also difficulty maintaining sleep. So we really need that relaxation response. And that's how that all sort of works together. So um, current treatment for long-standing sleep problems in children usually include behavioral interventions and parental education. So often um, parents are instructed uh, to use techniques such as graduated extinction or systematic ignoring. And um, basically that's ignoring bedtime uh, crying and tantrums um, for specified periods of time. And while these are uh, effective methods, um, these should not be introduced to a child who's, who's in hospital. So it, these methods should only be implemented and introduced to children in the, you know, who are otherwise healthy, typically developing uh, children. So currently, there aren't actually any interventions to promote sleep in hospitalized children. And sleep education and, and relaxation, so again, focusing on that anxiety piece, might uh, be worthwhile to examine. So sleep education, um, again, it's a, an effective and cost-effective treatment modality. And usually it includes you know, information about the importance of sleep, consequences of not getting enough sleep, um, common problems that they may uh, encounter, and of course, um, providing information on sleep hygiene practices. So you know, trying to give them tips and tools to develop um, good bedtime or good sleep habits, so such as consistent bedtime routine, um, you know, avoiding bright lights during the night, so no video gaming, um, etc. And then the relaxation breathing uh, piece in children. So relaxation breathing is a process of reducing the experiences of anxiety symptoms, and it really helps to elicit that relaxation response, so decreasing that arousal of the autonomic nervous system in order for us to be able to actually transition into sleep and maintain sleep once we've fallen asleep. So in the literature, relaxation breathing has been used um, in hospitalized children um, for painful procedures such as lumbar punctures. Um, it's been used to manage symptoms of mild to moderate asthma exacerbations, and it has been used um, to manage recurrent abdominal pain. 
So this was the conceptual framework that sort of guided the study. Um, it's called the Relax to Sleep Program, and you'll notice that there's sort of two components to it. So the first component um, really targets the parent, and um, parental participation um, it's an essential component of the intervention because parents are in that position, in that unique position, to enforce um, healthy sleep habits. And then the second component would be the relaxation component. Um, and again, that relaxation breathing technique um, can elicit that relaxation response and sort of counteract um, the physiological and psychological arousal system, which is often induced by that anxiety. So um, really, because this has never been done, um, the primary objective of this study was really to develop this intervention and test it out to see, is this something feasible that we could actually um, test out in the future with a large trial? Um, and also, um, how acceptable this intervention is to the participants that you know, we'd like to, um, sorry, that would be doing it. So feasibility questions looked at, you know, recruitment rates, how much time does it take to deliver the intervention, how many children would we lose or how many participants would we uh, lose to follow up, and then acceptability. So did they actually enjoy the intervention? Did they enjoy the program? Um, did they use the components? Did they find these um, components helpful? And of course, for exploratory purposes, we wanted to see if there is actually any effect um, of this intervention, this Relax to Sleep program, on a number of sleep outcomes. So looking at total nighttime sleep, which was um, defined any sleep occurring between 7.30 in the evening to 7.29 in the morning. Other sleep outcomes that we looked at included the number of nighttime awakenings, the longest period of uninterrupted or consolidated sleep during the night, uh, wake after sleep onset, so that's the duration of time that the child was awake um, after initially falling asleep, and then we want to sort of look at um, are they making up for lost nighttime sleep during the daytime, so that was an important measure. And then we also want to follow them up home, so to look at whether or not any um, of those regressional um, behaviors were noted during the post-hospital period. So this is a pilot randomized control trial. We used two arms, so relax to sleep group was one, and then usual care was the other. Um, children were approached in a single-centered uh, quaternary children's hospital located in Toronto, and we used different recruitment units, uh, or sorry, we used different uh, units for recruitment, including general pediatrics, cardiology, and general surgery. And this sort of just gives you an idea of um, how we measured each of the outcomes. So all the sleep outcomes, and Dr. Stremler mentioned um, and described uh, the actigraphy. So in this study, um, actigraphs were worn and sleep diaries were filled once the child was randomized for three days and nights while they were in hospital. Okay, we also collected um, data at follow-up, including the post-hospital behaviors questionnaire. Anxiety was also measured at baseline and at follow-up. We developed an acceptability questionnaire, um, and that was at follow-up. And then the children's sleep habits questionnaire, um, that sort of looked at uh, their, their typical sleep habits, um, both at enrollment, so at baseline, and then again at follow-up once they've gone home. So to be eligible, uh, children needed to be between the ages of 4 to 10 years old. Um, they, needed, um, it, they needed to stay in hospital for three nights or anticipated to stay for the three nights for, um, to collect that actigraphy data. They needed to be in a single room and have their caregiver, so either a mom or a dad, to stay with them overnight. Children were excluded if they had an anxiety disorder, a sleep disorder, if they had any limitations of their limbs, if they were heavily sedated, um, if they were receiving palliative care only, um, or if they had uh, cognitive impairments that would really limit their ability to carry out the intervention. 
And so this sort of gives a, a flow diagram, um, just a basic flow diagram of, um, of how the study proceeded. Um, so 74 patients were approached, um, 26 did not meet the yellow, or sorry, 26 were excluded, six of them did not meet eligibility criteria. Um, baseline data and randomization occurred for 48, so 24 were randomized to the relaxed to sleep group and uh, 24 were uh, randomized to the usual care group. And we, we, didn't, we had minimal loss to follow up, you'll note in the relaxed to sleep group, um, we lost three along the way and uh, one in the usual care. So how did this intervention actually look like? This is the Relax to Sleep program, and so again, it included a portion of sleep education. On the right of the slide is um, basically the booklet that was provided to the families. Um, it's a 20-page booklet, and it contained information on sleep. So it gave an overview of what normal sleep is, right, how sleep works, um, what drives us to sleep, all of that, and also gave um, really uh, healthy sleep hygiene practices, but also information on what parents can expect sleep to be like during the hospitalization, but also what they can expect once the child is discharged home, so they're prepared. And then providing them with practical tips to promote these healthy sleep habits, not only during their hospital stay, but also once they've gone home. The booklet also contained information about uh, relaxation breathing and education on how to use relaxation breathing. Um, so relaxation breathing was taught to both the parent and the child. Um, what was great, if you see on the top uh, right-hand side, um, was a book. Um, there's actually two books were used. Um, the author is Lori Light, and the books were great because they actually provided great colorful imagery um, and the relaxation breathing technique was guided by the characters in the book. So that was a great um, mode for delivering uh, the relaxation technique. And then on the bottom there, that's actually my little girl because I do a lot of my practicing on her. Um, She's holding what's called the Huberman Sphere. And what's great about that, that was actually used as part of the relaxation technique. It expands and collapses, so to mimic the air flowing in and out when the child is doing um, the technique. Now, for older children, um, we developed a CD, a relaxation CD. And again, um, the CD just provided instructions on how to do that. Um, and this CD was uploaded onto an MP3 player and just and children could play it um, whenever they needed to. So in terms of results, um, these are just baseline characteristics. Um, you'll note that, you know, mostly equal on both sides. We did tend to have younger children, so the, um, the age it was uh, ranged at six years old um, to almost seven in the usual care group. Another thing to note um, was that uh, more children in the usual care group had a previous hospitalization in the last year. And um, scores on the children's sleep habit questionnaire. Um, so again, the children's sleep habit questionnaire identifies behavioral and medically based sleep problems. And um, baseline data really provided an estimation of the child's normal sleep habits typically in the home and uh, whatever difficulties they had prior to hospitalization. So a score of 41 or higher indicates um, some difficulty or some sleep problem. And you'll note that um, about 15, so 63% in the relaxed to sleep group scored higher um, on, the, uh, on the children's sleep habit and 17, which worked out to about 71% in the usual care group. So in terms of feasibility and acceptability, um, the recruitment averaged to about one patient per week for 44 weeks. We had a great acceptance rate of 71%. Um, there is good compliance and families reported that um, they really enjoyed using the relaxation breathing technique. They found it easy to use. Um, they found the tips helpful and that they would use this um, technique again in the future. 
So in terms of the sleep outcomes, um, what I've done is I've just listed all of them here. Um, but what's important to note, if you look at the column with the sleep outcomes, the nocturnal sleep, and that's in minutes, you'll note that the relaxed sleep uh, group over the average of the three nights slept um, 419 minutes, so that averages to about um, seven hours, and the usual care group about 370 minutes, so that just works out to about six hours. And the group difference um, was almost 50 minutes. So the relaxed sleep group achieved, on average, 50 minutes more nighttime sleep than the usual care group. But despite, um, it's important to note that um, both groups were severely sleep restricted. Um, they had the same number of nighttime awakenings. Um, same, usually, or sorry, same. Um, uh, stretches of nocturnal sleep period. Um, and then what's interesting to note is the late nocturnal sleep period, um, which is basically the period from 10 in the evening to 6 in the morning. Um, children in the relaxed sleep group averaged uh, a little bit more, or sorry, 47 minutes more than the usual care group. Um, also, the wake after sleep onset. So it could be that um, children in the relaxed sleep group were able to fall asleep faster um, after being awoken up. We don't know that. Um, let's see. Here we go. So in terms of the other research questions, there is no notable differences on anxiety levels, um, and also there is no notable differences between groups on the post-hospital maladaptive behaviors questionnaire. But it is important to note that in this sample, 73%, so the majority in this sample, did develop a new maladaptive behavior. In terms of the children's sleep habits, um, when looking at baseline and then follow-up, um, children in the relaxed sleep group actually had um, improvements in their sleep habits um, one week post-discharge. And in the usual care, their actual sleep problems got worse, as indicated um, by the scores there. So just to wrap up, um, the strengths of this study, really it's the first study to um, evaluate the feasibility and acceptability of a sleep inter intervention in a hospitalized setting. Um, the use of the RCT design, um, it's very rigorous. Um, we achieved good compliance. Um, we used standardized approaches for the intervention. We really ensured uh, treatment fidelity. And of course, we use psychometrically robust measurement tools and actigraphy, which again is an objective measure for sleep uh, periods and wakeful periods. So although the results of this study um, are encouraging, um, the limitation is that it, it was really a small sample size, so uh, we're not powered to actually detect um, significant differences. Um, this was done on a single hospital site and of course we use multiple units so there is uh, varying lengths of stay um, among this sample. Um, of course differences in pain intensity and recovery rates so again it makes it um, difficult to draw conclusions. So in summary, um, sleep is essential for good health. It um, aids in the recuperation and recovery of illness. The Relax Asleep uh, program was acceptable to participants. It was feasible. Um, and again, this, um, this study, the, the conclusions really uh, are encouraging, but further evaluation does need um, to be conducted in a larger uh, trial. And also important to note um, examinations of the triad of like sleep, anxiety, and pain in hospitalized children really needs to be examined. And of course, uh, parent sleep outcomes, which this study did not measure uh, parental sleep, but it would be important uh, to look at that in a larger study. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll pass it off uh, to Krista.
All right, thank you. Uh, once again, a couple of great presentations so far. Before we go on, we do have one question, and I know Krista and uh, Robin are sharing a microphone, so before you hand that microphone over, uh, there was a question for Robin uh, that came in, just uh, asking about some of the methodology, and perhaps, uh, at Frasini, you can respond to this as well, because you had similar, although you didn't have patients leaving the hospital. Someone was asking about strategies that you use to track down the participants to give back the wristwatch or the, uh, act, uh, uh, the actograph. Actograph. Yeah, so you can uh, download the sleep data afterwards. How 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 did you get people to come bring that back to you when you were doing the uh, the study? And they were also asking were patients from the same uh, geographic region or were they spread out? Um, so I can respond for um, for my study. It's a Frasini here. Um, in terms of the actigraphy, so sleep data um, using um, the actigraphy was only done while the child was hospitalized, so they were um, actually admitted and anticipated to stay for three days and nights. Um, once the child had the actigraph, um, the researcher uh, would go and collect that at the end of the study period uh, right from the unit. Um, so that's how... Um, I was able to retrieve those back. Um, I know in other studies, and Dr. Stremler can speak more to them, but uh, my study didn't actually f use act actigraphy data in the home. It was self-reported. Um, so, so for me, it was easy because it was the participants um, were in hospital. Hi, it's Krista speaking. Um, I've crossed the street this morning from SickKids to join Robin Stremler in her office, so greetings from the University of Toronto. Um, as I'll describe uh, coming up, my study evaluated the sleep experiences of parents in home care. And so as part of the study um, procedure, we carried out 85 home visits. Uh, we declared at the outset of the study that we would attempt to limit the driving duration of approximately one hour each way. So it was quite um, an investment in terms of time and our resources to ensure that we were able to um, get the acti acti actigraphs back and also make connections with families to complete the, uh, the uh, questionnaires at the end of the study period. Uh, that, that, that's great. Uh, we did have one more question for Efrasini. Efrasini. Uh, uh, Denise is asking, were you able to calculate a sample size from your pilot uh, for the full-scale RCT? And if you were able to, what is your proposed sample size? Uh, yeah, actually, I did. Um, so to detect a 30-minute difference, um, I would need... How much did I? I think it, I had like 124 total uh, for a larger, more definitive trial. Now, that was just a basic uh, sample size calculation. Um, we'd have to take into account if we were running a trial at multiple centers and if we would stratify uh, by age group as well. Right. Thank you very much. And just uh, once again, my chance to remind everyone to keep those questions coming. We'll take uh, any other questions that we get. We'll take after uh, Chris's presentation. When we and and feel free to ask questions of any any of the content at that point. Uh, it'll be open discussion. Any content about any of the presentations that you've heard so far, uh, please type them in, and we'll get to those after this next presentation. So we'll go over now to Dr. Uh, Krista Kelty for the last another presentation. So thank you all. It's really a pleasure to be able to describe for you um, the study that I also conducted as the major uh, component of my PhD program under the supervision of Dr. Robin Stremler. Uh, acknowledging, of course, uh, Robin, but also co-investigators on the study, Dr. Al Cohen from Sick Kids, a pediatrician, and Dr. Karen Spaulding at Ryerson University, a nurse um, with terrific experience in pediatric home care policy. The study was also made possible by the generous support of a number of funding agencies who were uh, provided uh, support in terms of operations of the study. And I also want to recognize the sites that cooperated in uh, recruitment and also the children and families who welcomed me or my research team as we made home visits in uh, the context of this study. So to shift to the family caregivers of technology-dependent children, these are family caregivers who care for children on a 24-hour per day, per day in home care, and these children have medical complexity. 
And we defined for the purposes of this study that we wouldn't limit it to specific uh, technology or specific machines, if you will, but we were rather more interested in the experience uh, and sleep in parents who lived with children using equipment that was not unlikely uh, to fail, and if it did fail in home care, would likely result in a negative outcome. It's important that we examine these family caregivers' experiences um, for many reasons, including the fact that society relies on these family caregivers to provide highly, highly vigilant and skilled care in their homes for up to 24 hours per day. So this brings us to the sleep outcomes um, and what is known about sleep outcomes in family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology. Uh, many of you who've tuned in today, no doubt, would acknowledge that sleep disturbance in family caregivers is a ubiquitous complaint. And indeed, the limited literature that informed this study at the time um, supported that family caregivers described poor sleep quality up to 100% of the time in uh, the few studies that do exist. The total sleep time, so how long these families um, reported, report that they've, that they've slept in studies, um, have been limited to two populations. Only uh, two studies exist for family caregivers of children on ventilators and one for family caregivers of children with bronchopulmonary dysplasia in home care using um, supplemental oxygen ongoing. In these studies, however, we see a consistent uh, total sleep time reported and in one study measured using actigraphy under seven hours. And we've also recently, uh, through the use of actigraphy, uh, recognized the unstable sleep onset and offset times for family caregivers of children using ventilators. As described by both Robin and Fro, sleep is a complex biobehavioral process. And in the context of the family caregiver, we know that sleep is necessary to support their health, to support their function, and to enable that they can sustain caregiving. Children with medical complexity, particularly those that um, choose to um, uh, uh, move towards home care with technology in place, we're finding that these children and families are now sustaining years to decades of caregiving as a consequence of, um, of moving to home care. And so we look uh, to uh, understand how to intervene. What is it that we might be able to do? So in preparation for this study, uh, we, I examined what effective and promising interventions do exist in the context of caregivers and recognized that there are some in the adult population. So caregivers of children, uh, family caregivers, for example, with dementia, with adult um, cancers have been documented. But to date, there have been no intervention studies that have described um, uh, a, a look at this in the context of pediatric home care. And so also part of my uh, PhD program was the opportunity to publish a systematic review that examined sources of sleep disturbance in family caregivers. So this is a review of the 13 studies that we identified where sleep outcomes have been evaluated in these family caregivers. And we've categorized that there are many factors influencing sleep disturbance, categorized um, for the purpose of this study under caregiver factors, child factors, and environmental factors. So what this meant for us um, in designing a research study is we needed to further understand the influence of these um, multiple uh, uh, factors before we were able to, able to move to an intervention. And so what was needed then was to address the limitations to what was known and data were needed to compare sleep and related outcomes using objective measurement. Prior studies, only one in the ventilator population had, had used, um, had used uh, an objective measure in a heterogeneous representative sample because these are the kinds of samples that actually show up in pediatric complex care clinics that are um, growing in number and volume across the country. And we needed to compare the sleep in these family caregivers to healthy age match controls. As um, both um, Robin and Fro have described this morning, we know that the age of the child matters in terms of uh, their sleep. But we also there is also um, population-based data to suggest that the age of the child matters in the context of the parent's sleep. So we needed to control for that um, in this study to understand, therefore, the influence um, or the further understand the relationships between the uses of technology for these children on parent sleep rather than just the influence of the child's age. 
we also, um, as mentioned, thought it was important to take the opportunity to explore which factors influence sleep disturbance in family caregivers. So this is the conceptual model. In other words, this is how we approached the study and how we thought about it. You'll see that we were um, primarily interested in the sleep quality and quantity. And the this, this study was informed um, by uh, understanding the complex uh, biobehavioral process that sleep is. And again, both Fro and Robin have described this in some detail today. Um, we thought about how, what influences we wanted to examine, and we were interested, of course, in the caregiver sociodemographics, their sleep hygiene, the child's, child's technology use, and sleep quality. And in, in the environment, we were in, interested in, um, in both the presence of home care in the home and um, other aspects like the sleeping arrangement. This model also um, recognizes that sleep has a relationship based on earlier um, studies and, uh, and learnings from the literature and practice with sleepiness and fatigue in arguably a um, unidirectional way and with health-related quality of life in depression in a bidirectional way. So this brought us to our primary research question. Across one week in family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology, what was the mean total sleep time? What was the mean longest sleep session? How many sleep deprived nights? And, what, and how many awakenings were achieved by these family caregivers? And we were also interested in what proportion reported poor sleep quality. Secondarily, the research questions um, helped us examine was there a difference between the family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology and controls in uh, measures of health related quality of life, depression, daytime sleepiness and fatigue, and finally, in an, uh, to explore in family caregivers which combination of modifiable risk factors best predicted both their sleep quantity and sleep fragmentation. The design was a prospective cohort study and objective and standardized measurement were used. We, uh, based on our sample size calculation, we uh, wanted to recruit a minimum of 40 family caregivers to both groups. As mentioned, it was important to balance these groups according to the child's age. We recruited from two hospital clinics at the Hospital for Sick Children, one the Complex Respiratory Care Clinic and the other the Complex Care Clinic through the Department of Pediatrics, and two community clinics, one in an urban setting downtown with a very mixed socioeconomic um, uh, spread, and similarly um, a, an, a one in the greater Toronto area, more of a uh, sub, sub, suburban community, um, again with mixed sociodemographic. And we, we sought to understand their sleep patterns across six days and seven nights, a full week. We included the primary caregiver of a child between 12 and 18 months of age. That child had a complex medical condition and was technology dependent at nighttime. For controls, we looked at family caregivers who had, no known, who had children with no known chronic health conditions. We excluded family caregivers if they had a diagnosed sleep disorder in sufficient English language to participate, if they lived um, greater than 60 minutes from the clinic, had an infant at home other than the index child of uh, under 12 months of age, or had another child living with medical technology in the home. For sleep measurement, we also used actigraphy, and in, for the sake of time, um, I'll, uh, I'll let it stand that Robin has described this in great detail. And we also used the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is a validated measure of sleep quality, self-reported sleep quality. Other measures um, for caregiver sleep hygiene, um, sleep, child sleep habits, were a validated measures from, the, from an environmental perspective. We counted the number of home care hours used at night, in, and uh, we also used other validated measures for health-related quality of life, depression, sleepiness, and, and fatigue. This is the study schema, and it re reflects that we had two um, groups moving through the, um, the study. We recruited in clinics. We, um, we then uh, ca carried out daily reminders, and families um, completed daily diaries um, while they also wore the actigraphy for the course of six days and seven nights. And then we carried out home visits at the time when we acquired the um, uh, actigraphy, actigraph back and administered validated questionnaires. Important to recognize in the schema is that we had a high success, success rate in terms of recruitment. We had very few family caregivers decline participation. 
and we would suggest that that uh, lends some validity to um, to the importance of the question, but also to um, to the results of the study themselves. We also had very few missing data and in fact only had one actigraph malfunction during the study period. One family asked to withdraw before completing um, and uh, only a couple of family caregivers who did not wear the actigraph as, um, as expected. We required a minimum of four nights for study purposes. So for data analysis, we carried out descriptive statistics, um, as, this, as uh, you see here, and also um, a number of inferential statistics to help us understand the relationships between the variables. So the results of the Care to Sleep study I'll share with you. From the sample perspective, we saw no differences between the groups on age, gender, relationship to the child, the number in the household, on three health variables that we examined, nor on race and ethnicity. But we did see group differences as displayed here on select sociodemographic socio variables. We would uh, be able to state, say from this study that the sample of family caregivers who depended on medical, who had children who depended on medical technology were more likely to um, be single, uh, to be less educated, to uh, be less likely to have full-time employment, and to have a lower household income compared to controls. The children uh, represented those who had a high use of uh, medical technology. They were using it on average at least 16 hours per day. The type of technology use is very uh, varied as you see here. Over 60% of the population use some form of respiratory technology. The most common technology used, and not unexpectedly, was the enteral feeding pump, but this was most often used in combination with another technology. 60% uh, or more um, reported a neurocognitive delay or impairment, and these families uh, at least 50% of the time described that they used mo oxygen saturation monitors in home care to support their uh, monitoring of their child. The use of home care for these families was something that interested us as so we collected um, data at intake from the families. We learned that they had, had been caring for these children in home care for at least six year, on average six years, excuse me. Uh, they, 60 percent of them used home care from any source, and you'll know that in Ontario the sources of home care uh, cover from public to private funding um, sources and, uh, and um, many agencies that would supply this resource. These families were approved for the use of in-home home care uh, for on, uh, on average 27 hours per week. And they reported that they typically used home care uh, during the nighttime period for only 18 hours per week. They described the typical reasons for missed home care shifts were, were uh, shifts were not typically unfilled because nurses cancelled them, but 20% of the time these shifts went unfilled because family caregivers chose to cancel the shifts themselves. We will describe the sleep outcomes and uh, just to uh, state that between group differences were found on all objectively measured sleep outcomes. So this was the primary outcome, total sleep time. And in these two graphs, you can see that the family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology, which is the group on the top, had a wider uh, variability in the amount of sleep that they achieved. They also had a uh, significantly uh, shorter sleep time of 40 minutes per night. Other sleep outcomes that we measured, again using actigraphy, was the total sleep time in the day. And we see these family caregivers achieving approximately a half an hour of sleep during this daytime period, considered between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., and uh, more so than controls, who achieved only 15 minutes. We see the longest sleep session also um, being statistically significant, both on days and nights. We hear that we, uh, we uh, understand understand from actigraphy that the number of nights under six hours representing a sleep deprived night uh, were uh, two out of the seven nights per week for family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology. And nocturnal awakenings were also more frequent and sleep quality was described to be um, significantly poorer as well. Other caregiver outcomes, differences were found on select variables. So looking at depression, Family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology um, experienced th three, 
more, three times more experienced um, above the cutoff for clinically meaningful depression. Three times more of these family caregivers also um, were measured to have problematic daytime sleepiness based on a cutoff on the upward sleepiness scale of above 10. They also, these family caregivers, had a higher level of um, self-reported fatigue. Notably, there were no differences in the measures um, for both physical functioning and mental functioning in health-related quality of life between the groups. This chart displays um, uh, the uh, results of multiple linear regression analyses that examined the relationship between caregiver, child, environmental, and demographic features, and the total sleep time, and um, the number of nocturnal awakenings. And interestingly, um, the only variable that predicted sleep in, this, uh, mo in, in both of these models, or in either of these models, was being female. So being female predicted, so being, so being the mother instead of the father in the context of this study, we had one grandmother also participate, um, uh, getting more sleep and having fewer nighttime awakenings compared to being male or being the father. The study provides evidence that family caregivers of children with, who depend on medical technology achieve inadequate sleep quantity and poor sleep quality. This is important because prior studies have not documented this conclusively using objective measurement in a heterogeneous sample, um, representative sample like the ones we see in complex care clinics. It also provides evidence that these families are at risk for poor health and impaired function. And these data would suggest that we need to pay attention to sleep disturbance, um, but that it's not an easy problem to, to address, that no modifiable risk factors predicted sleep um, in these family caregivers tells us that we'll need to do uh, further work to understand how to move ahead in the context of developing um, targeted interventions. These data would also suggest that sleep disturbance um, raises concerns around implications for safety and performance in these family caregivers. And it also is important to understand that while this study did not describe uh, that home care number of hours predicts sleep in, in this sample, the relationship between home care and, um, and sleep uh, in the context of this caregiver group is not clear. The family caregivers in this sample only used, on average, 17 hours um, of home care per night, um, per week, and so that is less than three solid hours of sleep, uh, or three solid nights of home care. Um, so I would suggest that we are, have not, um, relative to other studies, um, been able to f explore the extent to which um, optimal use of home care may influence sleep. So the strengths of the study, I would suggest, are the generalizability. We had high consent rates, few loss to follow up, a representative sample. The methods, um, it was important that we achieve balanced groups based on the child's age and have controls in place. Measurement strengthened by the use of actigraphy and other val psychometrically um, validated um, instruments. And study management, that we were able to look at this across six days and seven nights, where other studies have looked um, typically at sleep for uh, three to four days on, on a maximum. Limitations, we, we uh, observed baseline group differences in select socioeconomic, vari or in variables typically associated with socioeconomic status. Uh, sources of bias um, persist in the context of the self-reported measures. We had um, some challenges in uh, choosing measures for this population around quality of life and sleep habits in the child. And there are no, vol no validated measures specific for this population. Um, so we were using more general measures. And the sample size um, limits the model fit, meaning that our exploratory research studies were not ideal. We were not ideally powered to examine the exploratory research studies, uh, research questions around modifiable risk factors and their predictive capacity. Recommendations, however, from the study uh, that we can take away, we would suggest that it's important to consider as, as clinicians, as we interface with these family caregivers, uh, to ask questions about their sleep, 
it's important that we start to consider building uh, screening into routine assessment um, templates um, as we seek to achieve um, good quality screening and interventions for these family caregivers. There are solid um, education resources available from the National Sleep Foundation and the Canadian Sleep Society, for example, that um, could be uh, pulled into clinical practice. I would suggest it's also important that we uh, continue to consider the use of home care um, and understand what the fit is in the context of the family caregiver. Can we improve on how um, having, for example, nurses in the home at night can, uh, be better, uh, can better influence the um, family's capacity for achieving sleep? We would also uh, want to consider on a move forward basis asking families to describe if they have any concerns in home care about their safety. Do they have concerns about their likelihood of falling asleep, for example, when they're driving their children to clinical appointments, which, um, which we know is a high risk behavior. Um, and it's also important to think about the social imperative. This study cannot describe, um, or can, we cannot from this study take away um, understanding of whether or not the low socioeconomic um, uh, profile of these family caregivers was a consequence um, or uh, was in situ before these children um, were born, but it's important to recognize that we're increasingly seeing a relationship between sleep and, um, and family caregiver experience um, and, uh, for example, income in this very vulnerable population. So recommendations for research, and I'm getting to the end so we have time for questions, um, and I have the privilege of, privilege of being able to move forward with this program of research in my postdoctoral studies. I'm the Janice Rotman um, Pediatric Fellow for Innovation in Pediatric Home Care, and uh, while in this fellowship as a postdoc, I'll uh, be completing and have out initiated an, the study we're calling Exploring Sleep study. In this study, we are uh, looking to end user perspectives. So we are reaching out to family caregivers of children with medical tech, uh, complexity on home care technology and home care providers. And we're using mixed data sources. So we're using qualitative interviews and other um, quantitative instruments to help us better understand the perceived needs from these um, end users' perspect perspectives and their preferences for participation in future intervention studies. It's expected that, this, um, that, that uh, the Exploring Sleep study and the results from this Care to Sleep study will inform the development of a complex intervention, not unlike what Fro described today in terms of using a number of ways to target um, sleep and related outcomes in, in this family caregiver group. And it's important as we move forward and develop these interventions that we think about how they can be acceptable and feasible in uh, groups that are um, across socioeconomic status and where gender is um, perhaps suggesting an important uh, variable for consideration. So in conclusion, the Care to Sleep study provides evidence that family caregivers of children who depend on medical technology sleep less than necessary. They sleep under the seven to nine hours of recommended sleep from the, from the National Sleep Foundation for healthy middle-aged adults. And they have poor sleep quality, so they don't feel good in the morning. They don't feel well during the day um, in the context of um, their daytime, uh, their daytime symptoms and also how they feel when they wake in the morning. And it puts them, we would suggest, at risk for poor, for poor health um, and also impaired function, um, impaired function in the short term and also long term for cap long term capacity. So I would suggest that the care for the care caregiver imperative um, is upon us and that sleep disturbance is an important feature of the caregiver experience for further, um, to further investigate and understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so some great information there. Uh, we do have a few questions uh, in the box. Uh, so uh, uh, Krista and Robin, I'll sort of leave it up to you as to sort of passing your microphone back and forth, and hopefully both of you can sort of uh, engage in the conversation here. But the first question that came in, I think we'll start with uh, Krista on, on this one, but I think this might be uh, might be input from, from everyone. Um, Veronica is asking if you can comment on the availability of studies related to the importance of sleep and successful sleep hygiene habits for children exhibiting anxiety, sensory difficulties, and or aggression on a regular basis. She says, we jump to medicate these children, but perhaps are overlooking the impact of sleep on their function. It would be nice to have evidence and tools to share with parents and caregivers if they were out there. 
Hi, it's Krista speaking, and thank you for the question. A terrific question, and I'll start with um, uh, you know the declaration that my expertise is not in. Uh, the population of children necessarily with neurodevelopmental delay um, or neuro neurodevelopmental um, problems, except to say that 60% of the children, even in my sample of technology dependent, have delay or impairment. Um, we uh, increasing evidence would suggest that there is, that there um, is merit in exploring sleep hygiene and other aspects of behavioral interventions in support of children, um, and that's children across all. Um, so that's children. That's all comers. So that's healthy um, children in the community. Um, that's children with neurodevelopmental, and that would also include. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave it. Children with with neurodevelopmental and other um, other in uh, other outcomes. There's a better nights, better days. Um, uh, the group in Canada, um, Dr. Penny Corkum is the PI out of uh, Dalhousie, and uh, Robin is a, a, also a site, uh, uh, a member of that team grant in terms of its oversight. And that group is keenly interested in sleep and autism, sleep in other neurodevelopmental, um, with other neurodevelopmental de outcomes or challenges. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Because I was at the uh, the NeuroDevNet conference uh, in September, I think it was, and they had Dr. Corkum. Uh, they were sort of announcing that they were at. They used to be focused mostly on FASD, autism, and cerebral palsy, and a couple of other areas. And they've added this sleep component as it applies to uh, children with neurodevelopmental disabilities. So it will be some interesting work I, from that partnership with NeuroDevNet and the Better Nights, Better Day, Days team as well. So some interesting things to come, I'm sure. Uh, Veronica also asked if you can comment on the availability of, of studies and evidence related to the sleep quality for children with muscle tone abnormalities and or contractures along with uh, any successful strategies to help them sleep. Hi, it's Krista speaking. Um, the, the evidence is very limited um, for that specific population, but there's increasing evidence and interest in understanding the relationship between sleep and pain in children, or in, in, any, in any population, but also in children. So I um, would suggest that that's an area for ongoing development, but that that might be a way to, um, to consider that question moving forward. Uh, all right. Uh, the next question that came in was uh, asking, you know, we've got lots of evidence suggesting or demonstrating the, the, the challenges of sleep, particularly in hospital. Could you make any comments, and, and I'll, I think all three of you are certainly welcome some input. How, do, how sh should we as, as people in the clinical setting be changing what we do? Is it just about educating healthcare practitioners about the importance? So you've talked about, I think all three of you have mentioned uh, the importance of educating people on the importance of sleep and sleep hygiene. But how is there, do you have any suggestions for how we might set up our clinical services any differently? You know, we've got a lot of people transitioning to single patient rooms and, and that sort of thing is certainly helping, I think, uh, in that area. But is there anything else around sort of the clinical services and hospitals that you might be able to make that leap from the, the, the evidence that you've presented here and how they might change things in hospitals to help with this situation? Sure. It's, it's Robin. I, I think I can comment on that. Um, you know, I wasn't able to present uh, today data on the work that we've done asking hospital administrators about what they provide families in terms of um, support and resources uh, to improve sleep. And I also wasn't able to present um, data that we have asking nurses what it's like providing care at night. And, and I think in order to make changes to improve sleep, we need to target all four um, groups of users, if you will. So the hospital administrators, the staff who provide care, and then the children and their families. So in many ways, I think we know what we need to do. We need to reduce noise. We need to reduce light. We need to make available to families the kinds of interventions like those that FRO um, has presented, you know, in order to uh, help um, promote relaxation, induce sleep. But I think key is getting everyone to work together so that 
the administrators have a better appreciation of how the policies that they put into place serve to separate families at night and disrupt their usual sleeping arrangements. Um, for nurses, it's, it's really a challenge knowing that you need to assess your patients, intervene with your patients, and yet much of what you're doing is interrupting their sleep. And so I, I think there, there needs to be a look from the administrative perspective and the care perspective at how can we best uh, coordinate care, cluster care, um, you know, not just apply a Q4 hourly vital signs to everyone, but to take an individual approach. Uh, so that we can preserve sleep as much as possible. But that means that your patient safety partners, your clinical partners, your families are all um, giving input. So, so I don't think, um, I think this, the, uh, it's clear what needs to be done. The challenge is coordinating everyone together um, to really make those changes to care. All right, thank you. I think that's uh, potentially some great uh, uh, topics for for, an up for another webinar in the future uh, when we look at uh, what our administrators, our health hospital administrators, uh, think on this issue, as well as some of those strategies for for nurses and other healthcare practitioners to to think about. I think that might be some really interesting some interesting tools potentially for them to uh, to use. But we are just about out of time, uh, and I think we've uh, we don't have any other questions coming in from the audience. So uh, I'm just going to hand it over to you guys for any if, if you have any final comments before we. Uh, uh, before we wrap this up, and maybe we can uh, go in reverse order. We'll, or actually, why don't we start with you, Robin, since you've got the microphone. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you with any, anything you'd like to close this presentation off with. Sure. Thanks, Doug. No, uh, for me, uh, you know, obviously I'm enthusiastic about sleep, um, but what's most exciting to me is that um, we keep continuing to sort of unearth more and more about sleep's importance and, and that we are starting to move in the direction of interventions. Uh, I think it makes good sense to everyone that more sleep is better. Uh, so it's exciting for me to see us being at a point where we're, we're starting to rigorously develop and test interventions to make a difference for sleep for families so that they can be their best. All right, thank you. And Efrosini, any uh, final comments from you? Um, yeah, just to echo what Dr. Stremler mentioned, um, you know, obviously we have a vested interest in this topic and um, everybody's doing their part to um, provide the evidence and, and uh, try to make changes. Um, I think another route is also uh, looking at educating um, nursing students, which I try to do um, as a as a professor here at UIT, um, really looking at the importance of sleep uh, right from the nursing program. So when they're in clinic, when they're at their clinical sites, um, not only are they, they sort of have it in the back of their mind, like, oh, wow, this, this kid didn't sleep all night. Like, okay, maybe vitals can wait. And just, again, that critical thinking piece, but also, you know, the, the, the sleep component and the importance of that. So thank you very much for this opportunity because this is great. All right, thank you. And Krista, anything to, to finish it off with? Oh, yes, thanks, Doug. Uh, I, mean, I, I would suggest that um, there's an opportunity moving forward when we're thinking about integrated uh, systems for home care, when we're thinking about what family caregivers tell us they need the most. Um, Time and time again, family caregivers will describe that they need, quote unquote, more home care or more respite um, services. And so the program of research that I'm interested in, in uh, building upon seeks to understand, you know, the relationship between, for example, the use of home care and the patient reported outcome of sleep and, and their perceived respite. Um, because all too often we're um, s sort of targeting that we're trying to increase the number of hours of home care, where sometimes I think it may be more important to try and target improvements in the caregiver experience um, around sleep and respite. And um, that said, it may mean more hours of service um, it are required, but it also may, for example, mean that future interventions could look at things like, is the time of the day 
of, uh, for services in the home aligned with the caregiver's need for sleep? Um, and can we be more sensitive to those kinds of um, caregiver experiences um, so that we can be more in tune with, um, with their, their experience and support them long term? So I think um, sleep is a terrific um, patient reported outcome that lends itself to a number of interventions, often complex interventions, but it's also um, a way that we can move forward as care teams across the continuum of care um, because we can touch these families um, as healthcare providers in many, in many venues. All right, thank you. And a great way to close it off. So thank you to your three great, pre uh, great presenters and great, excellent researchers from our nursing uh, network. Uh, we hope to, as I said, I think you've got some great stuff coming in the future, particularly the uh, any any partnerships with the, the work of NeuroDevNet, our rehab community, I think would be very interested in hearing how a lot of this uh, sleep research applies to the uh, the disabilities community. So so some great opportunities going, uh, going forward. So thank you very much for a great presentation, and thank you to our audience for joining us today, as always. Uh, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it's always great when you can watch live, as your questions really make for a great discussion. But when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the CAN. And we will also post any uh, presentations. If our, if, our, if our presenters are able to make them available to us, we will also post the slides on the Knowledge Exchange Network as well. Uh, next week we are off. We have a break next week and coming back November 25th we'll be hearing from our colleagues at the Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research known as the HALO Research Group from the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute and they're going to be talking about looking beyond inactivity and unhealthy diet. How should we address obesity in, 2000, in the year 2015? So I think it's going to be a great look at sort of the the, the, the overview, Obesity 101 so to speak, just sort of look at what the, uh, what the current situation is. Uh, with the with that uh, that that issue and uh, and how we might uh, approach uh, that that challenging issue differently going forward so we can actually make a difference and then following that on December 2nd we'll hear again from our colleagues in our uh, neonatal and pediatric transport community who will be talking about administrative and operational challenges in neonatal pediatric transport interfacing clinical care with transport regulations we've got a great panel that's going to lead a discussion on the administrative and operational challenges that exist when we go from a relatively well structured and regulated care system and, and, and environment that exists within hospital and healthcare, the healthcare system, and then we uh, transport that to the back of an ambulance, helicopter, airplane, where we have a new layer of, of transportation regulatory requirements, and how we can interface those two uh, worlds, and what some of the challenges are, and how people are addressing those, either working within or around some of those regulations in some cases. So it'll be an interesting, uh, interesting conversation then for for anyone who works uh, in uh, transporting uh, patients from. Uh, rural remote centers to our tertiary centers. So uh, some great stuff coming up in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and we hope to see you back here next week. Bye, everyone.